Welcome to 410 through 411. And here we're going to start talking about the idea of genetics and really talk about one man specifically, Gregor Mendel. Uh, this is the guy you see right here. And he pretty much single-handedly started off what we now know as genetics and what we now understand as heredity. That's not to say he got everything perfect, but he at least got the fundamentals, the basics correct, which allowed for us to build the rest of the stuff that we now know. So we'll get more into like the fancy stuff later on, but for the next several days, we're gonna be focusing on how did he understand the basics, the fundamentals of how organisms are able to pass on their traits, their, their, their information that they have to the next generation. Now it's important as we talk about this idea of heredity or passing info on from one generation to the next, that he worked before there was understanding about DNA. You know, he worked before they, we knew what genes were. He worked before we had so much of the evidence that we now have. Uh, he lived right around the time of, and did his work, around the time of Darwin, you could say. Uh, so a lot of it was like 1850s, 1860s, or yeah, 1860s. So this was 150, 160 years ago. So keep that in mind as we discuss stuff. Now, around the time he started working, most people thought that the blending theory was the best explanation of heredity. So in other words, if you took someone who was tall and you bred them with someone who was short, you should get a medium. And so occasionally this did work out, but it certainly doesn't always work out. There's plenty of people that have children that are taller than either parent. And so you can either believe that somebody's been fooling around, or you can realize that there's other things at play here. And so Mendel started to suspect that something else was at play here, that this blending theory was not the answer to heredity. And so he had some skills that helped him address this. So he was a monk, which allowed for him to be educated. So he was able to go to the university. And while in the university, he really liked science, specifically plants, and he really liked math, specifically statistics and probability. I don't know that I've read anywhere he was a ninja, but I think that just means he's a really good ninja because we don't know he was one. So we'll leave that there with an asterisk. We're not positive, but I'd like to think so. So because he had this skill set, he was able to grow a bunch of pea plants, which we'll discuss coming up. That's using his botany skill. And then he was able to analyze the offspring that they produced using his mathematical skill and knowledge so that he was able to figure out genetics as we know it. So if you see someone say the father of genetics, they're talking about Mendel because he was the one that came up with at least the most basic rules that there are. Now he chose to work with pea plants for a variety of reasons. Uh, they grow rapidly. If you've tried to see, it's one of the hardiest plants. They grow pretty easily. They're not too picky. Uh, so it didn't take too much effort and they don't take too long to grow. You don't want to grow something that takes two years to get offspring. You know, with something like pea plants, you can potentially try to get through, uh, in some cases, multiple times in a year you could get through a crop if the conditions are good enough and the climate's good enough. He also liked it, and this was fortuitous, uh, he liked it because there were a lot of simple traits. And what I mean by that is it was traits where it was kind of either or. So in other words, you were going to be tall or short. You were going to be white or purple. There was only two possibilities. If he would have picked traits that tend to have lots of possibilities, like a lot of human traits, like height and things like that, I don't think he ever would have figured anything out. So this is kind of what limited his work a little bit because it only applies to the simpler scenarios, but you need to use the simpler scenarios to figure it out. It's kind of like trying to learn calculus before you learn addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, etc. that doesn't work out too well. You still need those simple things to get to the rest. So pea plants, were, pea, plants, pea plants were a good choice because they have a lot of characteristics or traits where there's only two options. And lastly, he could control their reproduction. When you look at the flowers on most plants, but it's also true of the peas, they've got these anthers, these yellow tipped pieces that stick up or down, depending if it's facing down. Uh, and then in the middle part, you've got what's called the stigma, which is at the end, and this is basically the end part of the female part of the plant. So pollen has to go from the anther to the stigma. Now, for this to work, you can either leave the anthers in place, you can let the, plower, let, the, let the flower just do its normal thing, in which case the pollen will typically fall on the stigma, and it will then 
fertilize or poll pollinate, as we typically call it, the plant. So that's what we call self-pollination. So the plant essentially pollinated itself. But you can also do what Mendel did, which would be clip these guys before the pollen officially was released. And then he could move around and he could pollinate them however he wanted. And so this would be what we'd call cross-pollination. So there's self-pollination when it's just one guy straight to himself. And then cross-pollination where we could take pollen from one specific plant, say a tall plant, and he could go over to a short plant and pollinate it on his own. So he could then control essentially who the, I'll say mother and father loosely, because they're not, every plant produces both pollen and it produces the actual uh, ova. So they're both kind of male and, and female. But he could control which plant pollinated which plant. And so this made it very useful for him to track stuff. So he could figure out what's going to happen if I cross this tall guy with this short guy, this purple flowered guy with this white flowered guy. Now we said Mendel looked at seven different traits in pea plants, each of which had these two possibilities. So going through them quickly, when you look at the actual seeds, the peas themselves, the possibilities were round or wrinkled. They could essentially be yellow or green. Flowers had two different colors, white or purple, pretty obvious. The pods themselves could also be yellow or green, so that's a color choice. And then they could be smooth, essentially, you know, like inflated, full, whatever you'd like to call them, or they could be where they're more form-fitting, what we call constricted. And then lastly, the stems could be tall or long, that's the same thing there, or short, that would be the other one. And then you can be axial, which just means the flowers are more like further up the branch, they're not at the tips, versus terminal, which means they're at the actual tips of the plant. And so these seven traits, each with its two possibilities, were the things that he looked at. So some basic terminology. When we start off, the two original plants that we're going to cross, that we're going to mate, uh, those are going to be our parents, our parental or P generation. Now, once we've gone through and we've crossed the parents with the parents, we're going to get offspring, and we call those offspring F1, or first filial, the first set of offspring. Now, we can then take an F1 plant, and we can cross it with another F1 plant. And then that's going to allow us to get essentially grandchildren, right? Parents, children, grandchildren. And we call those the second filial, okay, F2. If I went through and I crossed two F2 plants, I would ultimately get F3 and on and on and on. So this is just a way for us to kind of keep track of how many generations we've gone through. And we just want to have a set terminology to use. So I will typically and frequently use this idea of P for parentals, F1 for the first generation of offspring, and F2 for the second generation of offspring. The trickiest part is remember that the F2s came from breeding two F1s. It had nothing to do directly with the parents. Indirectly, sure, because that's how I got the F1s. But just be aware, if I'm asking about these F2, it's the F1s that were breeding. So you've got to make sure you're aware, aware of what they look like, you know, aware of what they're doing. The other terminology is I'm going to frequently use the term gene, whereas Mendel would have more likely said characteristic. He would have said, you know, there's a characteristic for height. There's a characteristic for flower color. This is the general thing. And then for those characteristics, there were different factors, different versions, essentially, of the gene. And so we're going to call those alleles. So for height, there are two different factors or alleles. There's tall and there's short. We'll commonly represent those, if you remember, uh, if it's dominant, if it's the one that tends to show up more. Because ultimately, if you have a dominant and a recessive, the dominant will always win. It'll always overshadow a recessive. So in other words, if I've got this idea of a tall allele, which we'll represent with capital T to try to show it's dominant, and then we've got short, which is a recessive trait, so we normally use lowercase t. So that way I can see that if I have an organism that's big T, little t, we know that big T wins. So this person would be tall, or that pea plant would be tall. Now, if they're little t, little t, all right, now we've got two recessive alleles. There's no dominant to win out, so this would be a short individual. Just like, obviously, if it's big T, big T, that would also be tall. And so Mendel was able to figure a lot of this stuff out. He understood dominant versus recessive. He understood that there were characteristics and there were different factors for each characteristic. But I just want you guys to realize, too, I'm probably going to use gene and allele most of the time because these are our modern terms for it. So I'm normally going to say you have the tall allele instead of the tall factor. But you might see me go back and forth a bit, especially initially, because you know this is Mendel stuff. He didn't know about genes. He didn't know about DNA. He didn't know about these things. So he used kind of general terms 
We do know about those things now, so I will try and use the more specific terms just to get you used to them. Now, for Mendel's first set of experiments, kind of the first breakthrough that he had, he went through and kept self-pollinating the different types of pea plants until he got what was called pure or true breeding plants for each type. So he got these plants that when he self-pollinated them, always gave him purple. And when he self-pollinated them, always gave him white. We now know that was because they were essentially having two factors, or two alleles, that were the same. So if this guy's got two purple alleles, and he self-pollinates, he's going to be purple. There's no other option. There's no other allele. Just like if you have two white alleles, and I cross you with yourself, which also has two white alleles, you get to choose from white, 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 or white. You're going to be white. Okay? So he got these pure breeding plants, which always self-pollinated to produce identical offspring. And then he said, well, what happens if I take this guy that always gives me purple offspring and this guy that always gives me white flowered offspring and I cross them? So he cross-pollinated them and he found that the entire next generation was purple. This was odd. He was expecting blending, so it should have been like light purple uh, or maybe a mix of purple and white, but he got all purple. So the F1 was 100% purple, which allowed him to realize that purple is dominant. And we'll go over how he kind of figured that out, but he knew that purple wins essentially. That you've got purple and white, purple wins. Now the interesting thing he did is he took some of these purple plants that he produced and he crossed them. So he got an F2 generation. And that's when he noticed this weird thing, that he ultimately got three purple for every one white. So he got this ratio that we now know pretty commonly as three to one. Three dominant guys, one recessive. So this was kind of interesting to him because suddenly this trait that disappeared, it was gone, pops back up. You guys might know of this in your family where you say like, oh, this skipped a generation. You don't have to immediately call Maury or something. You know that sometimes you can have where some people have red hair and then maybe they wouldn't the next generation, but then maybe it comes back, and that's okay. This is what Mendel was able to demonstrate reliably happened. So for all seven traits, he got this three to one ratio. This one's just using uh, the specifically the flower color, but this happened for tall versus short. Tall was dominant. This happened for yellow versus uh, green when you're talking about the peas. Yellow was dominant. And so this happened over and over again for each. And so he was able to reliably get this 3 to 1 ratio, so he knew there had to be some explanation. And that explanation is his law of segregation. Now I know this sounds bad. You're like, law of segregation, <laughs> we've been here, that's not a good thing. All segregation means is to separate. So what he figured out is that we have two alleles in a normal cell. So you guys have two alleles. So you're like big T, big T, or big T, little T, or little T, little T. Or if we're talking about flower colors, we'll use big P because purple's dominant, so you can be big P, big P, big P, little P, or little P, little P. You know, these two would be purple. This guy would ultimately be white flowered. So knowing this, he was able to realize that, okay, if you only pass on one of them, so if you split this, so if I start out as big P, little P, when I'm making gametes, I can only give one. So I can produce essentially a, we'll say sperm here because it's easier to draw, that has a big P, or I could produce a sperm that has a little P. But that's my options. Those are my two options. So the offspring will only get one of those. And so this means that you can have where an individual is a, what we'll call a heterozygote, means mix, so they've got one of each. So if I have this heterozygote that's got a mix, they will look purple, but the white's still there which could explain why if I cross two of these heterozygotes where the first guy can give a big P or a little p, and the second guy can give a big P or a little p, you'll remember that there's these different ways of mixing it. We'll get more of this in detail later, but we could get big P, big P, big P, little p, which would still be purple, or we could get little p, little p. So we get this kind of three to one ratio from this scenario. So this was the genius of Mendel, that he was able to figure out just based upon this experimental data that all of us have, at least normal animals and plants are, that are diploid, we have two of everything. This is what diploid is. So for every gene, we have two alleles.
But when we make our gametes, we only have half that. Remember haploid gametes? They only have one. And so because of that, you can have traits that seem to disappear because you're a heterozygote, you've got one of each, it's the, the recessive is hiding. But then the next generation, if they get a recessive from you, and if they get a recessive from the other parent, it can show back up. It's not gone, it's just hiding. So law of segregation just explains essentially that gametes only get one set of chromosomes.